ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Verily all praises are due to Allah alone We praise him, we seek his assistance We seek his forgiveness and we seek refuge in him From the evils of our own selves and from the consequences of our bad deeds Whoever Allah guides, there is no one who can lead him astray. And who, whoever Allah lets stray, there is no one who can guide him. I openly testify that there is none worthy of worship other than Allah alone without partners. And I further testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his servant and final messenger. As for what follows, the phrases just rehearsed to you in Arabic are called Khutbat al Haja, the Sermon of Need, as a title or as a uh, reference given to them, given to those words and those phrases uh, by the scholars. They are uh, phrases of dhikr and praise of Allah and Tawheed testifying to the oneness of Allah that were used by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in many occasions and it has remained as a practice instituted by the companions in their time and by the com by the Tabi'un the students of the companions after them and the Imams of the religion as a practice for beginning one's speech and today we have begun with that with those words in our verbal address our class here on Kitab al-Tawheed and we will begin to open the book today after our discussion of the importance of the book the issues contained in it and all of the things we discussed last week looking at the words of the ulama about the importance of the book. So this week, we will begin reading the book, and I mentioned what I mentioned about Khutbat al haja so that we could compare it to the Khutbah, or to the introduction, written by the author, Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in his book, Kitab al -Tawheed. He says, as his introduction, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Two names of Allah that refer to His mercy. The possessor of mercy, the owner of mercy. To distinguish between those two, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, the scholars mention that Ar-Rahim indicates the possessor of a mercy that is specific to the hereafter, meaning mercy that is specific to the believers, those who shall be rewarded on the Day of Judgment. And the name Ar-Rahman includes the meaning of mercy, the possessor of mercy, whose mercy extends to even those who disbelieve in him, to those who reject his message, to those who fight against his messengers, that he envelops all of them, all of the creation, animals, Birds, fish, trees, wildlife, all of it, all of it, all of that uh, receives the mercy of Allah Ta'ala uh, in this life. However, the mercy that is the salvation forever from the hellfire and safety and eternal bliss and happiness, that mercy is reserved for those who offer Allah His right those who give Allah his right and do not violate it. And that right is that he is worshipped alone. So uh, so the author has begun by saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and then he says Kitab al-Tawheed, the book of Tawheed, naming his book. 
the point we want to mention here is that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in a written work, like a letter written to someone inviting him to good, or uh, like a book written, is also a sunnah from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and from some angles is more appropriate than khutbat al haja Now if we've mentioned that khutbat al haja was his sermon, was his introduction to many of his speeches and many of his admonishments, then how can I say now that Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim may be more appropriate to begin a book with? That is based on a distinction made by some of the scholars that the Basmala saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is the best Sunnah or the best practice to be instituted and the more specific practice of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when done in one's writing when done in one's writing the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam wrote to the kings and the rulers of his time and he wrote the pact of hudaybiyah and he wrote a number of things he wrote to people in a number of occasions and his writings consistently began with bismillahir rahmanir rahim in the name of allah the All-Merciful, the uh, Ever-Merciful to the Believers. So, then we see that that Sunnah, or that practice, was indeed taken from him, from the companions and the Tabi'un, and it was passed on. And it reached some of the authors of the greatest books of Islam, that they only began their books with the introduction using the phrase Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah the all merciful the the one whose mercy encompasses the believers on the day of judgment an example of that would be Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari the great imam known as Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah he died in the year 256 the author of what we know uh, or what we refer to as Sahih al-Bukhari, the most authentic compilation of hadith with chains uh, written. His book began simply with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Kitabu Bad Il Wahi, the bu- the book of the initial bringing of revelation. He began simply with in the name of Allah, the ever merciful, the one whose mercy encompasses the believers on the Day of Judgment. He began with the Basmala. So with that, a number of scholars all the way into later times, including Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab, began their books with simply saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Furthermore, some of the scholars, especially those who were compiling hadiths of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, along with ayat in chapters like Sahih al-Bukhari and Kitab al-Tawheed, they feared that to write an introduction from their selves, from their own words, other than Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, might be considered blameworthy from the angle of implementing the statement of Allah يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ O oh, you who believe, do not put anything forth in front of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So some of them considered that from the best application of this ayah to make it inclusive of so many things would me- means that we allow it to apply even to the books that we write. So that if we write a book containing ayat and ahadith, the most appropriate introduction would be simply to name Allah and to begin with the blessing of Allah's name and say nothing from our own selves and go right into what Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have said, whether that is obligatory or not, simply to apply the ayat in every possible way it could be applied. With that, that is likely the motivation 
uh, behind many of those authors who began their books with simply the Basmala uh, and it is likely or we have to say likely because we can't confirm and say this is absolutely why the author began with the Basmala other options or other um, alternate explanations have been offered by some of the scholars a commonly quoted hadith about any sermon or any speech that begins with uh, without the basmala is deficient this hadith attributed to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is actually not authentic and it's not to be used as a proof for beginning a writing or a book or a class or an address with the basmala rather the generality of the practice of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is what establishes for us the legislated nature of beginning with it and not the hadith which is attributed to him uh, which means who, whoever or any speech that begins any speech of any importance that begins without the basmala is deficient and again that is not authentic let us begin with the uh, reading of Kitab al-Tawheed after understanding that the author says Kitab al-Tawheed wa qawli Allah ta'ala wa ma khalaqtu al-jinn wa al-insa illa li'abudun and Allah the Most High has said and I have not created the jinn nor the mankind nor mankind except that they worship me from Surah Al-Dhariyat the 56th verse so the name of the book is Kitab al-Tawheed. The, the word Kitab means maktub, something that has been written. And al-Tawheed is the masdar or the verbal noun from wahada yuwahidu, tawheedan, to consider something to be one. Wahada as-sufuf. There were many rows, so someone came and made them into one row. Uh, the word Tawheed has many applications in other than Aqeedah meaning Wahada Al-Turuq Wahada Al-Manahij a person took the many roads that were available and made them into one main road in construction Wahada uh, Al-Manahij perhaps people concerned with curriculums saw that the teachers were using too many different curriculums so Someone came and united them all upon one curriculum. So that is all uh, from the general usage of the word Tawheed. Wahada yuwahidu, to make something into one. So when we use the word Tawheed, like in the word or in the phrase Kitab, Tawheed, the book of Tawheed, it is not left upon its general linguistic meaning. The book of making things into one thing. Or the book of considering things to be one and singular. Rather the intended meaning is Tawheedul Ibada Lillahi. The the servant making his uh, acts of worship for Allah alone, meaning singling out Allah with Ibada, with worship. Or more generally, singling out Allah with the three ad the three kinds of Tawheed. Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, that Allah Ta'ala is the only Lord, the only Creator, the only Sustainer, the only Provider, the only One who brings life and death. And He is alone and singular in His Uluhiyyah, in His sole right to be worshipped alone. No one shares anything with Him in that regard. No one, not the highest of angels nor the best of the prophets, nor the most righteous people who ever lived, none of them share in his right to be worshipped in the slightest way. And the third way that we make Tawheed of Allah is with regards to his names and attributes. He has the most beautiful and perfect names and attributes. And there are none who share in any of them with him. None who share in the perfection and beauty of his names or attributes in any way whatsoever. He is a Samir, the all-hearing, who
whose hearing encompasses all voices in all places. And he is Al-Basir, the one who is all-seeing. And he sees each and every action, openly and secretly, and nothing is hidden from his sight, while he is far above the creation. While he is, rather let me rephrase, while, there, while he is above the creation, above his throne, and the reason why I rephrase that, I don't like to say far above, because وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عَنِّي عِبَادِي فَإِنِّي قَرِيب, right? If my servants asked you about me, then tell them I am close. We describe Allah with closeness. And if a person is disobedient, we don't say Allah is far from him, we say he is far from Allah, and we attribute the distance and the act of being away or far from someone or something to the sinner and to the person who has committed crimes and not to Allah who is close to the servants. Naam. So to rephrase that he is above the heavens, above his throne, and he can see and hear everything. So there, those are two examples of attributes for Allah and names of Allah that none share in the beauty of and the perfection and the completeness of them. Now, so that's what we mean when we say a tawheed is to single out Allah with his rububiyyah, his uluhiyyah, and his asma wa sifat. And Allah says, and I have not created jinn or mankind except that they worship me. Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan, hafidhahullah ta'ala, in his book Al-Mulakhas, and this is where we will be taking the majority of our points of explanation from, the summarized explanation of Kitab al tawhid He gives five points of explanation, five brief ones, to this ayah. He says, firstly, we understand from the verse the obligation of worshipping Allah or singling out Allah with all acts of worship, that obligation that exists for all of the creation, all of those who dwell on the earth, from both types of creation, both types of the responsible, accountable creations, the jinn and the mankind. As a side note, jinn are similar to mankind. Jinn, they are a species of creation, a species that Allah has created, that remain generally unseen as part of the unseen that we believe in that he has informed us of you can read Surah Al-Jinn and you can read references to the jinn in other parts of the Quran and throughout the body of literature of the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the jinn have been created from smokeless fire and they have the obligation just as we do of hearing and obeying the messengers sent by Allah. And our Prophet wasallam was sent to all of the jinn and all of the mankind. And it is mentioned as one of those things that is specific to our messenger wasallam, Meaning the previous prophets were sent to their people or certain people, but not in an all-encompassing comprehensive manner that they were responsible for conveying their message to all of humanity and all of jinn kind the jinn have specific rules physical rules that govern their existence that are much different than the rules that govern our existence and the details of those rules are known to Allah and we don't know about the details of them except we see clearly from the descriptions of the jinn and the mentioning of the jinn from the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that their lives are obviously uh, governed by those different laws and the details of that discussion are for a more focused lesson on our belief in jinn the second point offered by Sheikh Salah al-Fawzan to benefit from this ayat is that the the creation of jinn and mankind had a reason or a purpose and that is clearly that they are made as worshippers to worship Allah 
Thirdly, أَنَّ الْخَالِقَ هُوَ الَّذِي يَسْتَحِقُ الْعِبَادَةِ دُونَ غَيْرِهِ مِمَّنْ لَا يَخْلُقُ فَفِي هَذَا رَدٌ عَلَى عُبَّادِ الْأَصْنَامِ وَغَيْرِهَا As for the Creator, He is the one who deserves the worship alone, no one else from those He has created. How can someone who cre- who has created himself and does not create deserve to be worshipped? As the scholars have mentioned, the very mention of Allah being the creator and the provider and the one who brings life and so on, the rububiya of Allah, all of that is mentioned as a lead-in or as an introduction to the importance of Tawheed al-Ibadah, Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, the kind of Tawheed that is the very uh, essence of the calls of the prophets that they are to single out Allah with all acts of worship. Since the one who brings life and death, he should be the only one that we direct an act of worship to. And the one who provides for us everything that we have, of food and clothing and breath, life, all of that is a proof that he is the one, the only one who has done that for us and the only one that we should worship as well. So, rububiya, or the fact that Allah is the creator and the sustainer and the provider, this issue is mentioned in the Book of Allah as a lead-in to the obligation of worshipping Him alone. As it is generally a concept that is agreed upon even by the disbelievers, the polytheists of Mecca who worshipped others beside Allah. They believe that Allah alone was their sole provider and their creator and the one who brings life and death. So they affirmed for Allah, his rububiyyah, that he is the only creator, the only sustainer, and so on. Yet, they did not affirm, they did not accept Tuhid al-ibadah. They did not accept that Allah deserved to be worshipped, worshipped alone. And it is a flaw in logic, since how could a created thing that is totally reliant on the creator deserve worship from other created beings? Fourthly, from Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan, بَيَانُ غِنَ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ عَنْ خَلْقِهِ وَحَاجَةِ الْخَلْقِ إِلَيْهِ لِأَنَّهُ هُوَ الْخَالِقُ وَهُمْ مَخْلُقُونَ To understand that Allah is free of need, Allah the High and Exalted does not need His creation and has no uh, He has no need for them, yet they are the ones who need Him because He's the Creator and they are the created beings. The fifth point is إِثْبَاتُ الْحِكْمَةِ فِي أَفْعَالِ اللَّهِ سبحانه, That we understand from this text and every text that talks about something that Allah has done, whether they are أَفْعَال إِخْتِيَارِيَة or صِفَاتْ فِعْلِيَة whether they are attributes that He does, that He always is described with, or whether they are af'al ikhtiyariya, specifically the af'al ikhtiyariya, those things that Allah has done at certain times, like creating the heavens and the earth, creating mankind and jinn, or anything else that Allah has mentioned that He has done, they are done for a very high, lofty, noble reason, or wisdom, or goal. Nothing that Allah has done is without a complete and perfect objective. Nothing was done in play or to waste time. Allah Ta'ala is far removed above such an idea. So all of Allah's actions contain the highest wisdom and the most noble aims and goals. So we say that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has created and He has created for the highest uh, and most wise reason and that is to establish his right to be worshipped alone within the actions of the created realm within the actions of the created beings the author goes on in the text of the book to say وَقَوْلِهِ وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ and Allah's statement or the statement of Allah and we have sent we have dispatched or sent forth to every group of people 
a messenger, proclaiming, Worship Allah and shun the Tarut. And the Tarut is taken from the word Turgan. It is Mujawazat al Had. It's to go beyond the limits. So everyone who has been worshipped, everyone worshipped besides Allah, being pleased with that, then he is a Tarut. He is a Tarut. So the general meaning of the verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned or has made a historical fact here, mentioned a historical fact that in every generation or every group of people there has been a messenger calling them to the worship of Allah alone and to abandon those things that have been worshipped that are worshipped beside him. And he has continued on sending those messengers to groups of humanity throughout time from the time of Adam to the time of Noah all the way to the last ummah the last group of people the nation of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi jami'an wa sallam uh, may Allah raise all of their ranks and grant them all peace what is to be understood from this ayat as it relates to our study firstly as Shaykh Salih al Fawzan mentions أن الحكمة من إرسال الرسل هي الدعوة إلى التوحيد والنهي عن الشرك. That the reason for sending messengers, all of them, has been to invite to توحيد and to prohibit the people from acts of worship dedicated to other than Allah, a shirk. Secondly, the Sheikh mentions حفظه الله أن دين الأنبياء واحد. وهو إخلاص العبادة لله وترك الشرك وإن اختلفت شرائعهم. He says that the religion of the prophets is one, and it is to purify one's worship of Allah and abandon all forms of shirk, associating partners with Allah, and that is even when the prophets had messages or had differences in the applications of those messages throughout different times meaning it was permissible for such and such nation to eat such and such food in this time that they lived in and another nation may have been allowed to eat that food and so on so there are some different specific rulings giving to, given to each nation again all under the specific legislation of Allah so therefore it was the most suitable and best legislation for each people in each time. Now, the third point, أن الرسالة عمت كل الأمم وقامت الحجة على كل العباد and that the risala, the message, has uh, been conveyed to all of the people, all nations, throughout history. And the proof has been established against all of the people. And there is a point there that needs to be raised, that that is general speech and there is a specific exception to that. But in general, Allah has sent the messengers and their messages have reached all corners of the earth in a general way and the proof has been established upon the people in a general way. Specifically, the there are some people called Ahlul Fatra, people who men mata fil Fatra, people who died in a time where they did not hear the message of the new prophet. Their message was corrupted and the message of the next prophet after the one that was sent to them did not reach him. So his message was corrupted and he didn't hear the message of Tawheed as, as, as clearly as it was conveyed. Or he was deaf. Or he had another excuse. For example, a child died young before reaching the age of Tamiz before he could reach the age of his own understanding and holding his own opinions. So, will Allah punish these people who have not had the hujjah, the proof established against them? While in general we say the proof has been established. Specifically we say no. Individual cases of a person who never heard about Tawheed for whatever excuse being deaf, dying young, uh, having the message reach them when they were too old, 
uh, senile perhaps to even understand the message and so on these people as reported by the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam will be given a special test on the day of judgment according to an authentic hadith or a number of authentic hadith reported from the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he said three kinds of people will have arguments in their favor that will be heard the deaf person the child who died young and the Manhalaka uh, fil Fatra, the one who died in the period between messengers, and other narrations mentioned uh, an old man, a senile old man, and they will give their proofs or give their arguments on the day of judgment, and they will be heard. And Allah, from His uh, perfect attribute of justice, will put them to trial on that day to see are they obedient? servants of Allah or are they disobedient and rebellious to the order of Allah and he will order a part of the hellfire to to rise up or to become clear to them to be visible to them and they will be ordered to enter it and then the ones who have been destined to be from the people of eternal bliss and happiness the people of paradise they will enter into the fire, no questions asked, obedient to their Lord. They will find that fire cool and soothing. And they will, as a result of their obedience, enter the paradise. With that one test alone. Woman kutiba alayhi shiqawa, and whoever has had the has had, had eternal misery destined for him, the disbeliever who rejects and disobeys and turns away from the order of Allah. They will say, كَيْفَ نَدْخُلُهَا وَمِنْهَا كُنَّا نَفِرُ How could we enter to the, in this fire when we used to run from this in the worldly life? So, they will be made to enter the fire because of their disobedience to Allah and that test. So specifically, there are specific exceptions to the generality of the proof being established upon mankind. And that doesn't contradict the statement of the, the explainer here, Sheikh Saleh and Fozan. Rather, his speech is general. And the exemption or the uh, exception I made is a specific exception for specific cases. Whoever wants more details on that topic can refer to the CDs available from Troy called The Rulings on the Disbelievers Who Die Young. That um, lecture has research in it covering these ahadith mentioned, the hadith of al-imtihan, the hadith of that specific test given to those people who have excuses, and other ahadith about the end result of the children of the polytheists who die young, and that's the relevance to, uh, that's how it's relevant to our class today. Now, the fourth point offered by Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan in explanation of the verse we have sent to every nation a messenger proclaiming that you should worship Allah and shun false deities he says the high status that Tawheed holds and that it has been an obligation on every single group of people who ever lived on this earth fifthly in the verse is what is contained in the statement la ilaha illallah of negation and affirmation la ilaha there is no one worthy of worship no deity worthy of worship la ma'buda bihaqqin nothing that deserves worship Illa Allah, except Allah. So there's a negation, a negation of all things worshipped with right. Then there is an affirmation. There is an exception made, other than Allah or except Allah. In that phrase that we utter often, La ilaha illallah, there is a a similar kind of negation and affirmation in this verse. The 
messengers sent to every group of people said, Worship Allah, there's your affirmation, and you have to negate the, the rights that are claimed that some have the right to be worshipped other than Allah. فَدَلَّتْ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ لَا يَسْتَقِيمُ التَّوْحِيدُ إِلَّا بِهِمَا جَمِيعًا So it shows here that Tawheed cannot be established correctly except by way of the establishment of both the affirmation of Allah's right to be worshipped and the negation of others who claim or that it is claimed that they have a right to be worshipped. وَأَنَّ النَّفْيَ الْمَحْضَ لَيْسَ بِتَوْحِيدٍ that simply to negate that others have the right to be worshipped is not tawheed by itself. And that to say that Allah deserves to be worshipped without negating others' rights to be worshipped is not tawheed by itself. Tawheed must have both elements. That Allah is to be worshipped alone, or that Allah is deserving of worship, and secondly that no one besides Allah deserves that worship. The author goes on in the text of Kitab Tawheed to say, وَقَوْلِهِ وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَنْ لَا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا From Surah Al-Isra, the 23rd verse, And your Lord has legislated that you shall not worship other than Him, and you shall be dutiful to your parents. And you shall be dutiful to your parents. The Sheikh Saleh Al-Fawzan says there are five points of relevance here. The first one, أَنَّ التَّوْحِيدَ هُوَ أَوَّلُ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ مِنَ الْوَاجِبَاتِ وَهُوَ أَوَّلُ الْحُقُوقِ الْوَاجِبَةِ عَلَى الْعَبْدِ That Tawheed is the first thing that Allah has begun with here when mentioning what is an obligation upon the people and it is the very first of all rights, all obligatory matters or all rights that the servant must fulfill, that a person must fulfill uh, in his life. The very first and mo most deserving of attention is the right of Allah to be worshipped alone. Secondly, ما في كلمة لا إله إلا الله من النفي والإثبات ففيها دليل على أن التوحيد لا يقوم إلا على النفي والإثبات نفي العبادة عما سوى الله وإثباتها لله كما سبق Again, another similar phrase or a similar usage of the Arabic, like what is found in the phrase La ilaha illallah, there is no one worthy of worship other than Allah. Nafi and Isbat, negation and affirmation. The Tawheed will not be established unless both things are present and a negation of others or, or people who, or, or things that are worshipped besides Allah and an affirmation that only he deserves worship. And that is the phrase, أَن لَا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا And that you do not worship other than him, as has preceded. The third point, عَظَمَةُ حَقِّ الْوَارِدَيْنِ حَيْثُ عَطَفَ حَقَّهُمَا عَلَى حَقِّهِ وَجَاءَ فِي الْمَرْتَبَةِ الثَّانِيَةِ the, the greatness or the superiority of the right of the parents, the rights of the two parents. Since Allah has mentioned them, right after mentioning his soul right to be worshipped alone. So it comes in, in rank second, after the Tawheed of Allah, you must be dutiful to your parents. Thirdly, عَظَمَةُ حَقِّ الْوَالِدَيْنِ one fourthly, وُجُوبُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَى الْوَالِدَيْنِ بِجَمِيعِ أَنْوَاعِ الْإِحْسَانِ لِأَنَّهُ لَمْ يَخُصُّ نَوْعًا دُونَ نَوْعٍ That the obligation to be dutiful to one's parents includes every type of good behavior and dutifulness. Every possible type. Since Allah Azza wa Jal has mentioned it in an unrestricted way, meaning you must be good to your parents, and He did not limit it to a few actions, to a set number of visits, or to a certain kind of assistance offered, or to a certain set of phrases of respect to be uttered in their presence. Rather, respect, dutifulness, and honoring one's parents is a wide open topic, including every single type of respect 
and dutifulness that can be included in the generality of that. We are to be dutiful to them in every way of dutifulness. Fourthly, or fifthly, تَحْرِيمُ عُقُوكِ الْوَالِدَيْنِ The prohibition of being disrespectful or negligent to our parents with regards to their rights over us. Then the author goes on to say, وَقَوْلِهِ وَاعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا From Surah An-Nisa, the 36th verse. And worship Allah and do not commit any shirk. Do not worship anyone along with Him in any way. The first point of benefit from that verse is وُجُوبُ إِفْرَادِ اللَّهِ بِالْعِبَادَةِ لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ أَمَرَ بِذَلِكَ أَوَّلًا فَهُوَ آكِدُ الْوَاجِبَاتِ that it is an obligatory to sing it is obligatory to single out Allah with our worship. Since Allah has ordered that first, and it is the most stressed of all obligations. Secondly, Tahrimu Shirk, the prohibition, the illegality of polytheism to offer acts of worship to other than Allah, the Allah Naha Anhu, Fahua Ashadul Muharramat. That is because Allah is the one who forbade that, and thus it is the most severe prohibition there is. Thirdly, أَنَّ الشِّرْكِ شَرْطٌ فِي سِحَةِ الْعِبَادَةِ لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَرَنَ الْأَمْرَ بِالْعِبَادَةِ بِالنَّهِي عَنِ الشِّرْكِ That it is obligatory to avoid shirk. And the avoidance of shirk is a condition for the acceptability of your act of worship, of every one of your acts of worship. Since Allah has mentioned them together, He ordered us to worship Him, and he forbade us from committing shirk. So anyone who is committing shirk in his act of worship with Allah will absolutely have that act rejected by Allah and as well all of his deeds. Fourthly, أَنَّ الشِّرْكَ حَرَامٌ قَلِيلَهُ وَكَثِيرَهُ كَبِيرَهُ وَصَغِيرَهُ That shirk is unlawful, prohibited, absolutely prohibited. The little of it and the great obvious forms of it as big as it may be or as tiny and irrelevant as some people may consider it. All acts of shirk are impermissible. لِأَنَّ كَلِمَةَ شَيْئًا نَكِرَةٌ فِي سِيَاقِ النَّهِي فَتَعُمُّ كُلَّ ذَلِكَ Since the Arabic construction here وَاعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا شَيْئًا Don't worship or don't make shirk with Allah شَيْئًا with anything. That phrase is min al umum phrases of unrestrictedness, meaning every single thing that could follow under the, that could fall under the word shay a thing, is to be rejected as an object of worship. So it is general and unrestricted, and no exception is made. Nothing may be taken as a partner with Allah. Fifthly, and lastly, from that verse. Uh, Sheikh Salah al-Fawzan says أَنَّهُ لَا يَجُوزُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ مَا اللَّهِ أَحَدٌ فِي عِبَادَتِهِ لَا مَلَكٌ وَلَا نَبِيٌ وَلَا صَالِحٌ مِنَ الْأَوْلِيَاءِ وَلَا صَنَمْ لِأَنَّ كَلِمَةَ شَيْءٍ عَمَّ And it's not permissible that shirk is made with Allah in a person's act of worship in any act of worship of his not directed towards an angel or a prophet or a righteous person, or obviously a statue or an idol, since the word shay'an is general and all-inclusive and unrestricted. And the last verse we're going to look at today is the statement of Allah Ta'ala in the text of Kitab al-Tawheed. وَقَوْلِهِ قُلْ تَعَالَوْ أَتْلُ مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ لَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا And his statement, say, come to me or Gather with me and I shall rehearse to you. Say, O Muhammad, to the mushrikeen, to the polytheists, come to me and I shall gather and I shall rehearse the things that your Lord has prohibited you from. Firstly, mentioned here in the text, Allah tushriku bihi shay'an, that you do not associate partners with him. And the reference here by the author, Al Ayat, the verses that follow. That is a reference to Surah Al-An'am, the verses 151, 
152 and 153. So, on your own time you can rev review those verses, but we'll mention to you the 10 basic rights or the 10 basic obligations that are established in that passage in a brief way, as a Sheikh Salah al-Fawzan has done for us here, that firstly, Allah has admonished you that you do not make shirk with Him. And that is a prohibition, a very general prohibition of all acts of shirk. And that includes any kind of shirk with Allah, any kind of object of worship, no matter how big or small with Allah, and any kind of action that is directed as an act of worship to Allah and someone else. All of that is prohibited, no matter how big, how relevant, how significant the object of worship is considered by the one who offers it, or no matter how significant or how big and relevant the act of worship is considered by the worshiper as well, all of those things are prohibited in an absolute manner. The second one, وَصَاكُمْ أَنْ تُحْسِنُوا بِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا He had, has admonished you to be dutiful to your parents. And that is by being dutiful to them, being uh, in their service and protecting them and uh, keeping all types of harm from them and obeying them in all issues that are within uh, permissible, the permissible range outside of the disobedience of Allah and to not behave arrogantly in their presence. To be very humble and and uh, and. and, and to consider them greater than you and to show that in your interaction with them. The third thing, that the our Lord has prohibited us or admonished us from not, uh, has prohibited us from killing our children in fear of poverty. Do not bury your daughters because you think that they shall, uh, their presence among you will cause you to work or cause you to, to, to not be able to eat because there are too many people in your house. Do not fear poverty to the point where you kill your children. For Allah is the one who provides for you and for them. The fourth point or the fourth right or fourth obligation that you do not go anywhere near illicit deeds. Fawahish. Ma zahara minha wa ma batan. Those who are those illicit acts of disobedience that are done openly and those done in secret. Fifthly, he has admonished you not to murder. He has warned you against murder. Sixthly, he has admonished you not to approach the orphan's wealth, not to come anywhere near it. The orphan is the one whose father has died before he has reached the age of puberty. So, in many times, the orphan may have inheritance that is set aside for him. And his caretaker will be responsible for that money, that inheritance, whether it's inheritance or a fund set up for him, or for any other reason that he has money, then the one who is responsible for that orphan may not approach it except to uh, invest it and cause it to grow for him, or to provide him, to provide for him through that money. Sixthly, or seventhly, that was sixthly. Seventhly, وَأَوْفُوا الْكَيْلَ وَالْمِيزَانَ بِالْقَسْتِ And, and uh, when you do business, weigh in full measure and give full volume. When you weigh, then weigh with full measure. And when you measure things in a volume, with cups and liters and things like that, then measure with full volume. And that is from fairness. And that order is not limited to the size of or the weight of the product being sold, but it is all-inclusive and includes an admonition for businessmen to be truthful, to be clear in their sales, to not be deceptive or cheating, that they be clear in what they're selling, to have products that are beneficial and halal, and to sell them in a way that is responsible and lawful. The eighth point and that when you say, وَإِذَا قُلْتُمْ فَعْدِلُوا وَلَوْ كَانَ ذَا قُرْبَى And when you give your testimony, and when you speak with some words, then be fair and be just. 
even if it is against a close relative. Even if it is against a close relative. So we have to be fair and say the truth and say what is correct, even if it's against those whom we love, those who are on our side, those who are our friends and our family. Rather, the truth is more beloved to us. And likewise, we say the truth in a case where we are offering testimony, even if it is in favor of someone that we have a problem with. In a court case, if you are requested to give testimony and you honestly saw something that was an act of oppression against someone you personally dislike, then i'dan, be fair and be just and offer your testimony in truth and do not hide your testimony and do not twist your testimony because of your animosity for that person. All of that is from the balance of Islam, from the balance of the manners required from every Muslim in these ten admonitions from Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is moderation. Ninthly, وَبِعَهْدِ awfu, And hold to the covenant of Allah by obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following His legislation and staying away from what He has forbidden you from. And by learning the things in His book and what His messenger has come with. And the tenth one, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلُ فَاتَّفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ And this, and say, this is my path, a straight one, so follow it. This is my straight path, so follow it. And do not follow the paths as they will divide you away from His path. So Allah in this tenth admonition has ordered us or admonished us and all of mankind to follow the path of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to follow our religion based on the uh, exemplification of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to abandon all other ways all other roads and paths that will split you up that will take you away from the following of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and with that we will mention the eight points offered by Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan in explanation of those verses uh, in a brief way and we will close today's class with that and firstly and the shirk a'zam al-muharramat wa anna tawheed awjab al-wajibat firstly shirk is the most the severest prohibition prohibited prohibited matter and that tawheed is the most obligatory of all obligations Secondly, the great status that the parents hold with regards to their right over their children, or their rights over their children. Thirdly, uh, the prohibition of murder. The prohibition of murder, especially if the murdered one was one's own relative. Fourthly, the prohibition of taking from the wealth of the orphan and using it for oneself the caretaker takes the wealth of the orphan and uses it for himself that is prohibited and the legislated nature of using that money to invest with it to increase that money for the orphan fifthly وجوب العدل في الأقوال والأفعال على القريب والبعيد The obligation of being fair in one's statements and actions in his dealings with his close relatives and those people who are strangers to him. Sixthly, وجوب الوفاء بالأهد The obligation of fulfilling covenants and oaths. Seventhly, وجوب اتباع دين الإسلام وترك ما عداه the obligation of following the religion of Islam and abandoning everything that opposes it. And the eighth point, أن التحليل والتحريم حق لله That declaring things to be halal and haram, that is the sole right of Allah alone. With that, we'll finish for today and we will continue, inshaAllah ta'ala, next Saturday with the statement of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud 
reminding you that beginners may extend their study of this book by gathering the ten rights or the ten obligations mentioned in those verses specifically listing them what are those ten obligations list them one by one in a brief way from surah al-an'am verses 151 to 153 intermediate students may list five texts five ayat or a hadith that contain a nafi and an ithbat a negation with an affirmation of something related to that negation whether that is in relationship to tawheed or in any issue like la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah there is no power and no ability except through Allah and advanced students what can advanced students do ah they can look f- to the books that we talked about called kitab tawhid those authored by other than Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and find out which of those books starts with the hadith that kitab tawhid starts with and I intend to say by that the first hadith in kitab tawhid by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab is the hadith of Mu'adh Ya Mu'adh atadri ma haqqullahi ala al-ibad O Mu'adh do you know what the right of Allah is upon his slaves upon his servants and the answer of Mu'adh and that hadith which is coming it's not to be confused with the statement of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in explanation of that verse that we read today which we'll begin our class with next week but the first hadith from the speech of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the hadith of Mu'adh what book from those books called Kitab al-Tawheed like the book of Ibn Manda, the book of Ibn Khuzayma, the book of Al-Bukhari and so on which of those books begins with that hadith the hadith of Mu'adh O oh, Mu'adh, do you know what the right of Allah upon his servants is? That's the challenge put out there for advanced students. May Allah Ta'ala bless you. And just to mention this, this uh, recording is not the lecture that was live from this week. This was redone as the equipment failed me. Qadr Allah wa ma sha'a fa'al. The recording equipment failed me here and I had to re-record the class to give that service to those who are not able to join us at that time where we give the class live but they would also like to uh, pick up on the benefits that we mention in this class and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless you all to grant you success in understanding the right of your Lord or to bless us all me firstly intended Bless us all with a firm understanding of the right of our Creator and actions that show that to be our main concern. And may He grant us success and accept from us. Wasallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.